through. We thank you for every mountain that you've taken us over. And now, God, we turn to hear a word from you. I have studied, but I need your strength. I have prepared, but I need your power. I'm willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my Lord, thy will to see. Open mine eyes and illumine me. Spirit divine, amen. Let the people of God say amen. If you love the Lord, say amen again. Glad to be here tonight. Say amen one more time. Amen. We may be seated to Pastors Carpenter and to all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, we greet you tonight in a name that is above every name. A name the Bible declares, one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Even the name of Jesus the Christ, I am grateful for this singing aggregation tonight. Amen. Amen. And when I saw Lauren going to the mic, I felt I felt like that, uh, you know, the Snickers commercial when it says not going anywhere. Because every time she gets up, I know it's about to be pandemonium. I said, I said, I told, I told Carpenter, I said, we about to die in here. We about to die. We about to die. We bless God. We bless God for for that reminder, because life really is a journey, and God has taken us. I don't think I'd get an argument in here tonight if I were to uh, suggest that most of us can look back over our lives and realize that if it had not been for him, am I talking to anybody in here? Amen. So we bless God again for tonight. And again, I thank God for Pastors Carpenter, uh, both of them. I thank God for their friendship. I thank God for... Uh, all these years that we have spent together, 13 years doing ministry in Center City. Uh, I bless God. And uh, amen, amen. And I bless God for their commitment. Uh, and I bless God for the modeling of this ministry, uh, both husband and wife, equally gifted, sharing space, uh, which uh, often is difficult to do and often uh, does not, uh, work well, and so we bless God for them for modeling for us what it looks like to love each other, lift each other, and so we bless God for them and bless God for this ministry. As I've watched over the years, uh, I was t- telling you last night how I remember when he was still working full time at SEPTA and how he struggled with um, doing SEPTA, giving his heart fully to this church, and uh, and I remember when he just decided, I'm, going, I'm just going to pull out and I'm just going to give it all. And I've watched the fruit of his faithfulness to this church. And I've watched how God has taken care of both this church uh, and taken care of him. And I was so uh, grateful. I walked inside and I got a blast from the past uh, because I remember when it happened to me. Uh, I walked inside, and I'm not saying that there's anything that we can do. It just it just comes with growth. Uh, one of the neighbors, one of the neighbors was wanting to get in here to get at him, uh, and wanting to get in here to get at him because of the parking. Uh, and uh, you know, there's not a thing. There's not a thing y'all can do about it. There's not. A, just make sure that you're never illegal. Make sure you don't take advantage and park in front of somebody. You know. Uh, but then there's always going to be that challenge. I never will forget back at West, this woman came down, and, I mean, she read me the ride act, real. I mean, she called me everything but a child of God, and one thing I could do but stand there and take it. Uh, and But it was also a part of what kind of comes with this, so I asked that you would pray for him. Uh, and brothers around here, you need to understand. I mean, I saw it with my own eyes, and so we ought not take lightly. Uh, those that are around the neighborhood that don't like the fact that it's packed in here tonight and, and they don't they don't like it and so you need to understand what the implications of that are and and I watched it as I was walking in I mean she came up and she came up strong and she's like I need to see the pastor as if he drove all of you all's cars in here and um, and she ain't want to give it to nobody else but she was ready to give it to him and uh, so we want to keep he and his wife in our prayers because we live in a different day and at a different time. Amen. Amen. So I solicit your prayers uh, for him. 
Amen. Well, I want to dig in. I want to dig in tonight uh, in a passage of Scripture found in the book of Mark. Passage of Scripture found in the book of Mark. Mark, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 22nd verse. God, I bless you and I thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to preach. I have studied, but I need your strength. I've prepared, but I need your power. I'm willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my Lord, thy will to see. Open mine eyes and illumine me. Spirit divine. Amen. Mark, the eighth chapter, beginning with the 22nd verse, very familiar passage of scripture. You'll find these words. And he came to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took him by the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, put his hands upon him, he asked if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to anyone in town. I want to stop right there, and I want to talk to somebody tonight from the subject, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Won't you, won't you, won't you look at your neighbor and just tell them, neighbor? neighbor. I'm, getting better. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I wonder, I wonder is there anybody in here tonight that can resonate with these words? When, when I look in the mirror t- today, when I look in the mirror today, I look at somebody that I, I like. And today I can say when I look in the mirror, I see somebody that I feel good about and, and I like. But, but let me help you with that because I've not always been able to do that. I've not always been able to look in the mirror and, and like the man that I see. I've not always looked in the mirror and been proud of the man that I see. Today I feel good about him. But even when I say that, I'm not saying that from a perfectionist perspective. My Lord. Because when I look in the mirror, I don't see a perfect man. I see somebody that ain't, ain't all that he's going to be, ain't all that he ought to be, but I certainly see somebody that ain't what he used to be. Oh, I wonder, am I talking to anybody in here tonight? I, when, when I look in the mirror, I see somebody that I can say is getting better. And the truth of the matter is that has not come simply from being in church and reading the Bible and experiencing the good days because, truthfully, uh, there are some songs that I resonate now, uh, that I resonate with, and that is songs like, I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days and some lonely nights. But when I look around, when I think things over, all of my good days, outweigh my bad days so I won't complain. But there's another song that says I've had many tears and sorrows. Old Andre Crouch, I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong, but in every situation God gave blessed consolation that my trials came only to make me strong. So through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. And and for some of you young folk that didn't know either one of these, Marvin Sapp said, never would have made it. Never would have made it. Now that I've been through it, I'm, I'm stronger. I'm wiser. Am I talking to anybody in here? I'm better. Not just because of the sunshine, but also... Because of the rain. But through all of that, I can say I'm getting better. Well, you may be wondering where I'm going because this text is tailored to teach us about the progressive sanctification of God. How God can find us where we are, take us through a process to get us to where we ought be. And along the way, you've got to learn how to celebrate not perfection, but progress. You've got to learn how to celebrate that you may not be all the way there yet, but at least you're not where you used to be. It's in the text. 
You know the story, and this is one of the stories that, that bothers us, particularly as Baptists. It bothers us because of our exalted Christology. And, and, what, and that's just 50 cent word. It means we think so highly of Jesus that this particular miracle causes us a level of anxiety. And it causes us a level of anxiety because it takes Jesus two touches. You know, this is the miracle where the blind man is brought to Jesus and Jesus touches him. And then Jesus says to him, what do you see? And the man says, I see men as trees walking. Then Jesus has to touch him again. Now that messes up a bunch of us because, I mean, if it's Jesus, how come the first touch didn't work? Well, let's flip it back on you. How come the first time you came to church, you ain't get perfect? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, almost like, it's almost like folk were sitting around, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to make any room for the young white boy that uh, killed all those people in, in South Carolina, but everybody was sort of struggling with how could he sit in Bible study for a whole hour and then right after that good old Bible study shoot all those people? And everybody was, was, was going up in arms. How could he sit for a whole hour and then do that? Well, how do you sit in church for a whole hour and then go right out of here to the liquor store? <laughs> I mean, before, before, we get, before we get too judgmental, just remember that everybody's in a process. So, so then what happens? I know you just get mad at me, but so... So he, he, Jesus touches him. He says, I see men as trees walking. Then Jesus touches him again. And he sees everything clearly. The text is tailored to teach us about a number of things that need to happen if you're going to get better. Well, the first thing that comes up in the text is real simple and sophomoric. It's plainly in the text they said that they bring a blind man to Jesus. They don't cover it up. They don't try to make it pretty. They bring this man and said, he's blind. Now, I know that sounds simple to you, but they call it what it is. One of the challenges right now, many of us can't get any better, is because we won't call the condition what it is. You can never heal from anything if you play with what it is. You cannot, and what has happened in our present society is no longer does anybody want to call anything anything. In fact, we don't even use the word sin anymore. If nobody has any sin, everybody has an issue. Nobody has any sin, everybody has an idiosyncratic, an idiosyncratic uh, personality or an idiosyncratic tendency as opposed to just dealing with what it is. Until I come to grips with who I am, until I come to grips with what's wrong with me, until I get to a place where I can come to a church that I don't have to fake it and can call it what it is, I, I will never get this thing off of me. I, in, in other words, I can't sit around and talk about I'm vertically challenged. I'm short. <laughs> Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Go on and call it what it is. Go on and call it because if you're really going to get help, you've got to be willing to call it what it is. And don't, don't be afraid of it because even once you name your sin, you won't be the only sinner in church. Because i got news for you. Everybody in here is an ex-something. Everybody in here is wrestling with something. So you might as well call it what it is. So the reality is, but watch this. After you call it what it is, you've got to be willing to get in position with Jesus. Now notice the text. Notice what the text says. The text says that when they brought the blind man to Jesus... Jesus then takes the blind man and watch this. He walks him out of town. He walks him out of town before he begins the healing. And the reason that he walks him out of the Seda before he begins the healing is because he's not going to be able to heal him where he is. Now, I know that messes with you right now, but you've got to read the healing in context. 
Bethsaida is a town that was very resistant to the gospel of Jesus Christ, so much so that Jesus says, if the miracle that I had done in your town had been done anywhere else, everybody would have come to know who I am. But because of who you are, I've got to get people out of here just so that they can receive the grace and the power and the miracle that I have for them. Jesus understood that the lack of faith in a particular context can mess up even his power. You, you all remember that when Jesus went back to Nazareth. Do you remember when Jesus went to Nazareth and he was preaching in Nazareth and some of the people said, ain't that Mary's baby? And the reason that they called him Mary's baby is because some people never bought the story about the Holy Ghost and about Joseph. There were some people that never did buy it, that he was the son of the Holy Ghost. So when they said, isn't that Mary's baby? In other words, they did not believe in who Jesus was. And the Bible says that Jesus could perform only a few miracles in Nazareth because of the faithlessness of the people. Come here. You need to understand that even if you're serious about getting God to move in your life, if you don't get out of the faithless context, sometimes where you're living can mess up what God is trying to do in your life. Sometimes who you're living with can mess up what your what God is trying to do in your life. Am I talking to anybody in here that's ever had to throw some folk off your boat? In other words, had to get some folk out of your life so you could get the healing that God has for you. Oh, I know I'm right about it. Let me unpack it. Do you remember back there at AI? Do you remember in the Old Testament after Jericho and they went to the next battle at AI? And when the children of Israel lost the battle at AI, a battle they should have won. And you do remember why they lost at AI. Because at the first battle in Jericho, when they marched around Jericho, they were told, when you go in there, don't take any of the stuff. Don't take any of the stuff from Jericho. But one person named Achan went in and took one of the little treasures, hid it under his bed. And just because he hid it under his bed, he caused everybody to lose. How quickly would you kick somebody out your life if you realized what they had under their bed was blocking your blessings? Y'all going to get mad at me, but I learned that some folk got to go if I'm going to go to the next level in my life. So here it is. Jesus took the man out. But you've got to be willing to work with Jesus. Now watch this. It says that Jesus spit on his eyes. Now before you get real mad at Jesus and before uh, you think that that's nasty, just remember, uh, number one, in this context, saliva at times was used for medicinal purposes. But if that does not work for you, remember, every one of you has had your mama do this to you. Every one of you can remember just before you took pictures in the third grade and you about to go in front of the camera and they said got them eyebrows together got some of that ash right off the side don't stop it don't mess with me but here it is it's even deeper than that because you need to understand that if you're going to get the healing that God has for you, you've got to be willing to go along and work with God in the process. You've got to be willing to do whatever God needs you to do. Here Jesus spits on his face. But if you track some of Jesus' healing. It's interesting what Jesus requires of people because he wants you to invest in what he's doing in you. In fact, sometimes Jesus even comes across as sort of mean. Have you ever thought about Jesus over there at the pool of Bethesda? He walks up to a man who's been there 38 long years and then says to him, do you want to be made whole? And the way Jesus reads, the way it reads is that Jesus walks up to him and basically says, dude, you you do understand how this works. Because the text says, and seeing the man had been in that condition for 38 long years, Jesus says, wilt thou be made whole? Jesus, in other words, because you do remember at the pool of Bethesda, it says first one in the pool is the one that gets the healing. Now, you've been here 38 years. Now, I understand if you wasn't first in year one, 
But after 38 years, you could have rolled a little closer. And so when he asked him, he's like, do you want to be healed? Y'all didn't like it. Let me come a little closer. Do you remember when he healed the, ma- the blind man and put mud in his eyes? Now, have you ever thought about what Jesus told the blind man to do? He put mud in his eyes and then told him, go to the pool of Siloam. I know you just missed it. How are you going to tell a blind man to go somewhere? Well, in other words, Jesus says, you wasn't born out here. And in your blind condition, you got out here to beg. So however you got out here to beg, use the same old thing you did out here to get your tail down the pool of Siloam. Can we come a little closer? How come you can take two buses, get a trans pass and a train to go to your grandmother's house to borrow $20 so you can go to the Stevie Wonder concert, but the bus or the van got to come get you to come to church? The same way you press for your sin, you need to press for God. The same way you went after everything else, you need to go in the same way for God. Can I keep pressing it? The reality is we know that there's power in praise. And don't get me wrong, I'm not mad at praise, team. But when did it come that you got to get somebody to whip you into praise? I mean, when I went to the club and I walked in, I didn't need somebody to get me up. I would walk in the club and hear my song. That's my song. I didn't need anybody to tell me it's now time for you to stand up. When I heard Luther, that's my song. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. So when you walk in church, you ought not need a praise team to tell you when to lift your hand. You ought not need somebody to tell you when to give God glory. You ought to walk in and hear amazing grace and say, that's my... Yeah. So then he touches him. He touches him, and here's what causes us some problems, because the man says... I see men as trees. I see men walking as trees. You need to understand that progressive sanctification, or in, even in this moment, this sometimes God can use your condition to teach somebody else about what God can do for them. Oh, uh, you missed it. Let me see if I can make it plain. So you see, you need to understand this healing in light of the larger context in Mark 8. When you read Mark 8, you'll notice that at the beginning of the chapter, that's where Jesus is saying about Bethsaida that they are like blind people or people who can see but don't know what they're looking at. And Jesus was saying that that is the condition of Bethsaida. Jesus was saying, I have performed miracles in front of you. You saw the miracles, but you didn't know what you were looking at. You saw them, and you still don't know who I am. So it is like you have a spiritual blindness. I mean, you can see, but you really can't see. So in comes this blind man. Jesus touches him, and Jesus could have healed him, but for the purposes of teaching somebody else something, Jesus allows this man to then be uh, have a blurry vision so that now this man is embodying the very condition of the whole context so that when people look at this man and his process, they are going to ultimately see what Jesus can do for them. If I was a better preacher, you'd be throwing something at me. In other words, sometimes you need to recognize that your condition wasn't even about you. It was that God chose you to use you as a billboard to show somebody else what God can do in their life. Oh, let me see if I can make this thing plain. In other words, God was simply using this man as a reference on his resume. Uh, and, And every now and then, God will allow your life to go upside down so that God can use you as a reference on his resume. Do you know what a reference on a resume is? You do know what a resume is. A resume is a document that uh, is used to get a job. And on the front of the resume, it says who you are. 
and it says what you can do, and it says the experience that you have, and then either at the bottom or on the back of the resume, it has a few names, and they're called references. You do know what references are. References are people that you can call on the back of the resume to ask if what's on the front of the resume is really true. Oh, I think I just said something. Every now and then, God will let some stuff happen in your life so that he can use you as a reference. Huh? Because his reference says he's a healer. Is there anybody in here that God has ever allowed you to get sick just so he can heal your body? His resume says he's a heart fixer and a mind regulator. His reference says that he can heal marriages. He can bring children home. His reference says he can fight your battles. His reference says he can protect you from your enemies. His references says he can do anything but fail. Do I have a witness in here that God is able to keep you? God is able to take care of you. Uh, but here it is. And here is the problem with the contemporary church. The problem with the church is you're waiting on me. There's some of you that haven't got to shout in yet. And you know why you're shouting in yet? You're shouting in yet because he's not fully healed yet. I'm still in the middle of the sermon. And you're waiting on him to fully see before you get excited. And so you're waiting for me to get to the last part of the sermon. And you're waiting for me to get to this part where I change my voice. And you're waiting for me to get to this part and I start talking about him seeing clearly. And then for some of you, that's the only part you want to hear. But the reality is, it ain't that time yet. And the reality is, but there's still something to shout about in the text. Because even though the man can't see clearly yet, he's not still blind. And that's the problem with the church. We waiting for everybody to see clearly when you ought to be able to shout when somebody, at least they ain't blind. No, I'm not perfect yet, but at least I don't say yes all the time. No, I don't have it all together, but I'm not what I used to be. Is there anybody in here that doesn't have it all together, but at least you're in here and ready for a second touch? There it is. So what happens in the text is that at this point, the man is not perfect. And the man cannot see clearly, but he is not blind. And so Jesus touches him again. And then for most of us, for most of us, when we read this text, we read it as a, we read it as a man born blind. And we read it as a man who was born blind, who is receiving his sight. So that there's another person in here saying, well, this ain't for me. And the reason it's not for me is that I was not born blind. And, and I appreciate it for those that were born blind, but this is not, this is a text about somebody who never had it and now is getting it. But you need to understand that I want to argue that the text seems to suggest that this is not about a man born blind. Because we already have a healing about a man born blind. But this is a different type of blindness. Let me see if I can argue. First of all, the reason that I want to argue that there's something else in the text is because of the grammatical, social grammatical interpretation of the text and then some of the context clues in the text. Well, the first thing that comes in is what it says. It says his sight was restored. Now, now, now I, I'm just going to I'm just going to suggest to you that if your sight is restored, then it must have been stored at some point. But then there's something else in the text. He says, he, after he touches him the first time, he says, what do you see? He says, I see men, but they look like trees. And the men are walking, but they look like trees. See, if, you were, if, if, if I was a better preacher, you'd be throwing something at me right now, because you would know it's not your fault, it's my fault. He says, I see men. Well, now, if you've been blind all your life, and this is the first time you're looking at some how you know what a man look like. But if, in fact, you have seen a man before, and life 
caused you. You do understand that one of the reasons that Jews did not eat the Jews did not eat pork is the dietary restrictions because pork at the time were a part of the uh, plumbing system of Jerusalem, and one of the major diseases in pork was trichinosis. Trichinosis is one of the diseases, one of the many diseases in first century Palestine that could cause blindness. It is absolutely possible that this man's blindness comes as a result of sickness or trauma in his life so that this is not only about how God can fix you but it's also how God can restore you. In other words there may be somebody in here tonight that used to be in a different place than you are right now and life has knocked you down and you feel like you're not what you used to be but if you'll allow the Lord to touch you and if you'll come back for another touch he can not only get you back to square one but he can restore your joy restore your peace am I talking to anybody that has ever felt like giving up but when you came into the house of God he picked you up and let you start all over again let me go on and tell the truth there have been some times since I've been preaching since I've been pastoring that I felt like giving, giving up and throwing in the towel but that's why I'm reminded that the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want and he makes me to lie down by green pastures leaves me beside the still waters restores my soul in other words if you go to him for another touch he'll let you get back up if you go to him for another touch he'll make you feel like doing it all over again in other words God will give you the opportunity to take a standing eight count and then come back out swinging let me see if I can make it plain. Do you know what a standing eight count is? You see, in boxing, if you get hit real hard, it didn't knock you out, but it dazed you. And then the referee sees that if you just get a little moment, if you just take a standing eight count, you'll be all right. So he doesn't call you out, but he just says, I'm going to count to eight. And then when I get to eight, you come back out swinging. If I'll tell the truth, there have been some times in life uh, that I've had to take a standing eight count. Uh, in other words, life hit me the wrong way. Uh, life made me feel like giving up. Uh, I wasn't down. I, was, I wasn't down, but I felt like throwing in the towel. Uh, but I found out that if I got a second touch, uh, and then I just took a standing eight count, uh, then I could come back out swinging. Uh, and I guess I stopped by tonight uh, to tell somebody uh, that if you come for a second touch, uh, God will give you a standing eight count. Uh, what does it look like to take a standing eight count in church? Uh, it means that every now and then uh, you ought to just stand right there, uh, count to eight, uh, and then give God glory. Uh, in other words, uh, I didn't think I was going to get fired. Uh, I didn't think I was going to be divorced. Uh, I didn't think they were going to die at this point in my life. Uh, I didn't think I was going to go through what I'm going going through, uh, and I felt like throwing in the towel, uh, but I took a standing eight count, uh, and now I'm ready to come on out, uh, and I'm ready to run on uh, and see what the end is going to be. Uh, so I stopped by to give somebody uh, a standing eight count. Uh, if you're in here tonight uh, and felt like throwing in the towel, uh, I stopped by to say, one, uh, God is getting ready to do a new thing in your life. Uh, two, uh, God is getting ready to Lift, be the lifter of your head. Three, God is getting ready to bless your life. Four, he will make ways out of no way. Five, God will cover you in grace. Six, Jesus died for your sins. Seven, he was buried in the grave. But eight, he got up with all power in his hands. Now that we're at eight, eight is the beginning of the next Next week, eight is a sign of new life. Eight is a sign of starting over. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm starting over. I got my sight back. I got my joy back. Everything is going to be all right. Say yes, 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 yes. I'm trying to leave y'all alone. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus, 
and all he's done for me. My soul cries hallelujah, hallelujah. 